Hello and welcome to Coffee and Conversation. I'm your host, Karim Rafa, and I'm joined today with Paul Everingham, the CEO of the Chamber of Minerals and Energy of Western Australia. Paul, welcome on air. Thanks very much, Karim. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's great to have you. And it is a bit of a weird time, which is why, unfortunately, we're on this video conference. But can you tell me about your sector in particular? I mean, the commodities in Western Australia is a prominent market as it is. How has COVID, how has social distancing impacted your sector? So we're a little um, nervous at the start of March uh, because of COVID. We have very large, uh, the largest in the world iron ore export sector here. And we've got a very large oil and gas export sector, one of the world's largest gold sectors and uh, really large bauxite and nickel sectors. A lot of them rely on um, fly in, fly out, uh, mining sector workforces, which means they, they might live somewhere else, say in Perth, the capital city of Western Australia, and uh, have to fly directly to the mine site and do a shift or a roster then. Uh, there was concern with the speed that COVID was moving that uh, all air travel in Australia might be shut down. And as a result, uh, our mines and gas platforms would be left unmanned and therefore shut as well. So the first two weeks of March were very sort of nerve wracked, uh, but luckily working with our state or provincial and our national governments, we're able to keep our airlines in the air and keep our mine sites and gas platforms operating over the journey. Absolutely. I can imagine that an industry of your scale and in your region on a, on a global level, but also on an Australian level, must give you some sort of sway when it comes to local governments, right? Particularly iron ore and oil and gas produce a lot of tax revenue for our governments in Australia. The airlines were making almost unilateral decisions to ground their planes. So the Commonwealth, uh, the federal and the state government here in West Australia really stepped in, gave certainty to the airlines. Uh, we put in place some fairly strict both travel, health and safety uh, frameworks and protocols that are still in place now. Every person getting on a flight to a mine site is being tested before they get on the flight and screened. So it's a very heightened and safe environment at the moment. Can you tell me a bit about how reliant exactly the economy is on the jobs created and the taxes? So what the wages look like, how they've changed historically and what's to be expected after all of this? Yeah, so look, going into COVID, the iron ore sector was quite buoyant, um, probably uh, seeing, and it still is seeing the best prices that we've seen since probably 2012, north of $100 US per tonne for um, seaborne iron ore. Gold is at extremely high levels. Wages are typically high, much higher than the average wage in the mining sector. They've stayed and they've remained fairly high. There have been some job losses because not all commodities have remained strong and particularly uh, oil and gas and, and bauxite are struggling. And bauxite had a tough year last year and again this year and, and oil and gas has slumped since March. So there've been some job losses, but by and large, across all the other commodities, employment has held up, wages have held up. I mean, a lot of it I assume is also to do that you are a world leader in a lot of the, these exports. That, that must give you some sort of influence on your trading partners, correct? Our major trading partners, particularly in those um, commodities and the North Asian superpowers like China, Japan and, and to a lesser extent South Korea uh, in oil and gas. Uh, it's the same as well. We send some oil and gas into the US as well. But North Asia uh, is our largest market. You know, we're very respectful of those markets. Um, we were concerned particularly with China and Japan and the impact of COVID there. But fortuitously, we really haven't lost a single cargo in the last four months. So that's a tribute not only to our sector, but also to the productivity and reliability of those ports in North Asia, the Chinese and Japanese waterfront really know how to do business. To get back to the effects of COVID on your industry, now we've talked about planes um, ramping up their security and making sure that everyone stays healthy and, and, and secure. Did your industry see any shifts internally on how business was operated on a day-to-day -day basis? Oh, definitely. So um, all of our mine sites and gas operations essentially closed their doors to non-essential staff. Operational and production staff only at the moment on mine sites and gas platforms. So they're probably 60% normal levels of staff. 
and everybody else is either working remotely at home or uh, you know in HQ. On those sites and those platforms, the other things in terms of work practices of what you'll know is a lot of the cafeterias and clubs that they have on these mine sites are shut. The gyms are shut. Uh, a lot of the social activity venues are shut. Uh, it really is do your shift, do your work, go back to your room. Um, there's plenty of technology available in your room, so you stay in communication with your friends and loved ones, but all of the social and interactive parts of mine sites on oil and gas platforms have been really limited to try and minimise the risk of spread of the COVID disease. I am quite curious though, I mean, with technology stepping in and all of a sudden it only being essential workers on site, there must have been some sort of equilibrium showing up that where you realize that these people are essential, this isn't just support that currently can't reach them, and this was superfluous. Is there anything in terms of digital aid that you're currently using that you think you'll keep in the long term? Oh, definitely, and I think a lot of businesses, not just in the resources and energy sector, have seen that uh, they can do a, a lot more of their business remotely, and I think that will lead to less people permanently on site and probably more people working remotely, uh, whether that be in uh, an operations centre in a metropolitan area, in corporate headquarters, rather than physically being on site because of products like you know, Microsoft Teams and Zoom proving so valuable and effective. None of our members have noticed significant drop-offs in productivity and so I think as a result you'll see roles being amended and changed, not um, abolished, but just d done differently and done remotely and probably done, as a result, more safely. More safely and possibly even more efficiently, right, with that, exactly. that much more control from remote. Could you give us up some examples of jobs that you think would be digitalized in the future? You can definitely uh, say in the iron ore sector, I think, um, you know, peer review roles are probably going to be able to be done remotely and that's traditionally been done on site so that's when you're getting you know parts of the organisation coming in and checking that best practices being implemented. I think you'll see a lot of that being able to be done remotely. I think a lot of the communication and transport control can be done remotely. That was already starting to happen pre-COVID, we've just seen it advance really quickly so that's you know the control of movement of not just people, but of machinery, including trucks, trains, ships. A lot of that now is starting to be done completely remotely at remote operations centres, and so that will come away from the point of where they operate and no longer be on site, but be done probably in a capital city or in a regional centre. I'm curious because you did mention that these changes were already happening before. Did COVID just accelerate? The, uh, Western Australia's movement towards this digitally enhanced and transformed uh, way to work? Exactly. I wouldn't say uh, we've had what you call unicorn change, which is things that you never saw before suddenly happening on a mine site. It's just really accelerated what had already started to happen. So trains were already being automated with uh, remote driven uh, locomotives in the Pilbara, uh, our iron ore province. That's now being sped up. Large dump trucks and uh, all of the D-series trucks, that big trucks that are on a mine site, a lot of them were starting to be automated. Now that's been sped up. So you can see sort of hybrids starting to develop that I think will only develop quickly and, uh, and eventually become the norm on most mine sites in Australia. Paul, I'm afraid that's all the time we've had today. Thank you so much for coming on air and talking to us. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I've enjoyed the chat. Great having you on air. Thank you all for watching. This was Coffee and Conversation. We'll see you soon.